who are we able to call? Universities are well situated. Uh, we have experts in economics, demography, sociology, but who knows how to navigate this complex system of offices and data requests and FOIA requests and, and calling a congressperson's office or staffers like Eduardo Loss, right? So, like, I didn't know how to do this and I didn't have time to do it. I have also my job that I needed to tend to and which suffered a little bit. And then finally, I, I, uh, the Puerto Rico uh, Evangelical Seminar reached out because they wanted to study the role of churches in this post-disaster. And they did not have any tools, they did not have any vehicles on, on how to collect data. And we, we helped them do this, and we produced a report that is available only in Spanish. But it, it is pretty much, I wanted to show you just a summary of this, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish quickly. But, you know, about, uh, we had a 22 participation rate, which is a little bit lower than what is for national surveys that are done. It's around 30 right now for a purely survey research centers, uh, surveys that are done. But, you know, 95% of these churches told us that they were providing support to their congregation or to the general public, so not only to the persons who were part of their congregation. About 70% of these churches uh, that, uh, said that their initiatives impacted more than 100 persons. And uh, over 90% of them provided spiritual guidance, food, and water. And even some churches went ahead and created small uh, tran uh, cash transfer programs so people and members of their congregation uh, could have some support for their financial, uh, or some alleviation of their financial needs. And they also serve as centers for distribution of goods uh, to make communications easier with co communities and also to cleaning uh, communities, in, particularly in rural areas in Puerto Rico. Uh, but one of the, this is one of the graphs that is in that report we produce. You know, about 20% of these churches uh, have experienced the death of at least one of their, the members of their community. 80% uh, of these churches uh, had out migration of a member of the congregation who left uh, and said that they were not going to return to the, the area they were serving. Uh, and about 65% uh, uh, had need for health services. They lost their job or they lost their house. And this were, uh, we, we were uh, surprised that we got so much responses, particularly from churches in the rural area of Puerto Rico. But again, it was really difficult to contact people at Comunidades de Fe or Senate of Puerto Rico to you know, tell them churches are playing a role here and I think they're being vastly underappreciated. And I have my own situations with churches, but they were doing a, a, a job that other institutions were not doing. And so we have this data also available. Right. So the challenges that we face is that academia moves slowly. The peer review process takes a long time. So uh, avenues like Twitter or the conversation are great avenues to start sending out pieces and bits of knowledge and start engaging in conversation. Uh, there's a level of uncertainty regarding the data that you are being provided. Uh, getting into the circles of influence and power and people who make decisions is challenging and difficult under normal circumstances. So today, I cannot simply go and say I want to go meet with Congress person X because that's going to take calls and probably make an appointment. It's going to take one or two weeks. But in post-disaster conditions, it's even harder. Uh, some, member of, some members of the government may ignore or politicize their research, and I don't, I'm not saying politicizing is bad. Like some people will argue that every research has a political angle, but I'm speaking about the bad kind of politics that, that does not help us communicate with those in the, in the power of making decisions or decision-making positions, right? Uh, and this simply post-disaster uh, conditions alters everything. It, we, we don't know how to navigate the system in a post-disaster because it's also a mini-disaster itself. Uh, but some opportunities is that there's emerging academic resources that can uh, speed the, this process. Uh, open science tools, archives where you can post preprints and people can read before it goes through the peer review process and they can provide you critiques uh, uh, to the initial work. Uh, they make uh, colleague, colleagues can serve as peer, as peer reviewers, even though it's not necessary to be uh, the peer review process controlled by a journal, but you can just give it to a group uh, of colleagues and say, does this make sense? Please check on this, so you are so you're sure that what you're putting in these archives is, a, is, is of quality and you're not 
you know, missing something that you don't have a, a blind spot, right? Uh, leveraging social media as an ally. Uh, I started an academic Twitter account and I have never left Twitter. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you know, Jay Fonseca bringing in more than 5,000 responses in one night speaks a lot about you know, the power that these tools may have and these women need to speak about how representative this sample may be, but it is information in times where we don't have information available. Uh, I also like some, uh, some of the recommendations to keep records of engagement with academic and government sector, because oftentimes they'll say they have never called me. No, they never reached out to me. They never. You know, oh, I have the emails. I've, I've emailed you on this month, on this month, on this month, right? And as well for helps, I think uh, the university is a low position because we have people in different disciplines, but we don't we don't know how to navigate the, the complexities of the policy side. Uh, there's going to be pushback, but there's also going to be people who hear you. This is an email I got from Michael Sjokovics and uh, Sjokovski, and his mom, his father, will have died out of a heart attack. Uh, taking care of uh, the energy generator in your house, right? So this is when you can put a name into the data that we are analyzing. Uh, and he, he pretty much was telling us, my mother-in-law is still living, the stress is rapidly accelerating the negative impact of her illnesses. It is a logistical nightmare, thank God for the Puerto Rican spirit. Her friends are supporting her while we figure out how to help her, right? So this is an email I got. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, this person Google me and send me an email. Uh, also address pushback with science. Uh, don't engage in, uh, I think the, we're well positioned also to address any pushback. I say, no, let's look at the, uh, the evidence. And, uh, and people do read these things. This is a very interesting email I got. I came across your editorial uh, while using it for dumb duty during the morning walk. Uh, <laughs> But then he said, yes, but I do read the stuff before I use it, right? And, he, and it turned out this person had been a former Trump Hotel employee, and he was telling me what was the psychology behind all the actions that were being taken against Puerto Ricans and the way this guy behaved as his boss. So it really opened my eyes to another side of, of what discrimination was uh, in, a, in an everyday context for this, this person. So regarding rights, I think universities are well positioned and have structures in place to work, uh, produce research in post-disaster environment with the tools that are already in place. Uh, there's, uh, I want to say that these three projects I presented, none of them I've gotten federal grants or any grant at all. I have not capitalized financially on this. I do this because I care about Puerto Rico. Uh, but it's, it, it does have provided, expanded my horizons to my academic and my academic productivity. So I may have capitalized somehow, right? As member of the community, communities, and as Puerto Ricans, for example, we're well positioned to reach into communities and understand their challenges, strengths, and areas of need. Uh, we are composed of persons in numerous areas which allows to, for a comprehensive approach, and allows, um, Cecilia uses these no blind spots, right? So it, it will reduce the blind spots that we may have uh, we may lose something, we may miss something at some point, right? And universities can help communities communicate with journalists and other bodies, such as policy bodies, uh, who can help them in this, in this kind of situations and conditions. Uh, that is all from me. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I am not an academic. It's very shocking. Good for you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I was feeling a little bit uh, as an outsider. But the reason I'm here is because of my other work that I've done as an organizer that fits just very well on the opposite spectrum of what Alexis was talking about. So, in the most basic situation, you have disaster, and there are two options it happened to you or it didn't happen to you. And I'm going to tell you a story where it didn't happen to me. It happened outside of my area, but it affected me. And it affected me in ways that, that I'm still trying to understand. Uh, many of you have seen this picture. Alexis just had it. It's on the uh, logo of the conference. And this picture, for some, uh, for people who know what may mean one thing, to me, 
it has a very emotional situation going on. It was a Thursday, I was heading to a meeting, and I'm checking their radar because I'm a geek and I don't look weather reports, I look at radar golfer maps, and I'm looking at this, and I'm seeing of the sheer magnitude of what was about to happen to Puerto Rico. You can see, obviously, it's a lot wider than the island of Puerto Rico. And here I was in Washington going to a meeting, trying to pretend that everything is normal, not knowing what was going to happen, but knowing that what's going to happen was going to be so devastating. So to me, every time I look at this, my voice cracks. And it cracks the same way that it did when we in D.C., and I'm talking in D.C. because that's where I live, but it would be like all over the place, anybody with a hard eating, we're trying to think, what can we do? What's going to happen? So for a couple of days, uh, I couldn't focus. For a couple of days, I couldn't. I really I tried to do all, none of the basic things that you can. I was changing the oil on my motorcycle, and it took me like four hours. It was something that should be a 20 minute thing. I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't post myself to do it. And at some points, I realized I need to take this energy and put it to good use. So I got on social media, and I started just, what's going on in DC? Some people were collecting items to send to the address to see what I'm going to do that. Um, it, this will shock you as well, but I'm, I'm not a well-built guy. But here I was. I was pushing boxes. I was lifting cases of water. And when I started that, that process of collecting, I met all the people that were doing that. It was amazing. I saw people, I saw so many Puerto Ricans in DC, I had no idea what we had. But I saw people from all over. It was not just Puerto Ricans, it was just everybody just knowing we need to do something. And, and it was great. But we did a couple of things. Here I am. This is the first uh, airplane that we loaded, and we shipped that to Puerto Rico. And we felt so good last night. That's like at 3 a.m. in Manassas Airport, right like 10 minutes away from Dallas uh, International Airport. And that felt so good. I had been up for, at that point for over 20 hours, and I had been like, pushing boxes, but that was so good. Until you realize, and in my case, uh, of pushing boxes, that was not enough. You know, I was, I was hoping to make a difference, but was I making a difference? And it's like, no, because the sheer magnitude uh, well, of the hurricane was not allowing me to really make a big difference. And at the same time, I had a job. I live in DC, I could not tell my boss, hey, there's a very good Puerto Rico, I just you know, need some you know, time off or short to leave uh, because there's a very good Puerto Rico and we're in DC. So what I started to think is like, what can I do? What are the things that I can do in my area that can have a greater impact? And during that process, I came with a very quick realization, I'm like, I'm 10 minutes away from Congress. I have a lot of friends that are staffers, that are lobbyists, that are communication specialists, all of these people that have this magnificent talent, and I think we can do a lot better and have a greater impact than shipping boxes to Puerto Rico. I'll tell you something that we learned in the process of shipping boxes to Puerto Rico. Uh, water is the most basic needed uh, item ever. You know, life is water. And when you tell people, hey, there's a need, people will come and say, oh yeah, here's a case of water. But I want you all to think about it for a minute. Well, water is heavy. Water, a gallon of water weighs about uh, 8.34 pounds. And that's a case of 24 bottles. Uh, water is cheap. You know, for four bucks, you can go to Costco and just get a case of water. So for the person giving the water, you're like, hey, I'm receiving items. Oh, fantastic. Here is a case of water because it costs me four bucks. And people in Puerto Rico are going to be happy. But leaving in D.C., trying to ship water, oh no, that's a nightmare. So here I am, loading that one plane, thinking, oh my god, I'm saving the world. But if I continue on that trajectory of receiving items and trying to ship them to Puerto Rico, I was gonna end up broke. Uh, a plane like that one, shipping just about uh, 147 cases to Puerto Rico from the sea, cost me about $8,100. Just think about it, $8,100. And think about it, we have 47 cases, the massive amount of trash that we're going to just send to the island. And if we would have had a little bit of time to really think about that for a minute before acting, because I just acted, I just went with whatever people were doing. I was not thinking, I'm not going to 
I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say, oh no, I have all these plans all along. No, no, no. I was just acting. Uh, if water filter would have gone a long way. It's a little bit uh, lightweight, uh, it's reusable, it doesn't create the same amount of waste or the amount of water that you can produce. But I did not know that. I didn't have that research. I didn't have that knowledge. I didn't have that coordination. Even on the, on the, all the people that I told you that I met, like from those people over there, the only person I knew beforehand was my wife, who was in the middle. I met those people that same day, and that's the same case. But one of the things that I think we failed as diasporas is we were not connected. I had no idea where my other fellow diasporicans uh, were. Not even in DC or even other states on what they were doing, what challenges they were having, and how we can harness the power of, of collaboration and organization. Uh, there are many things that I wish I would have had and I would have known. So that's why when I did the transition of trying to do something else, that's, that's when I realized I had a little bit more power. So what did I do in the, in the face of, of that part of this asset? Then I started going to Congress. I had to take time off from work. I had to organize with my friends. And I just having a basic question, what are you doing for Puerto Rico? I was not going there with a political agenda. I was not going there. I wasn't even going there for saying, you must help Puerto Rico because there are Americans that not even say that. I just wanted to make sure, is Puerto Rico on your mind? And it's remember the situation of Puerto Rico. We don't have an elected representative in Congress that votes. We have an elected representative that she is on uh, committees, but she cannot vote. So we really depend on the other 535, or basically the 535. That's a power that I, uh, I, I touched on something, I was just sharing this with Alexis, that really shocked me. I was visiting a member of the Energy Committee. Uh, I was talking to the member, I was visiting to a staffer. It was Monday at 4 p.m. by meeting, and I'm there asking the same basic question. What are you doing for Puerto Rico? What can I do? Is there anything I can do to help you and support you? And uh, this person said, yes, actually, there is an energy on PREPA, the Puerto Rico Power Authority, on Wednesday. Do you want to submit questions? Because we are not fully ready for that. That's something that to me just blew my mind. I had the power to basically influence. I'm not a paid lobbyist. I don't get paid to do this. Again, I do this as, as an activist. To influence the questions that were going to be asked at a hearing, at a congressional hearing. You know what I was lacking? I was lacking Alexis. I was lacking people like Alexis. I was lacking people that would have that research. And what I am thinking right now, and what I'm thinking is, like, why, why was why were we not organized? Why couldn't my university of Puerto Rico, I graduated from University of Puerto Rico, has been doing it Why couldn't they put something together that could harness that power? And the lessons learned that, that I would love for all the universities to consider are really about that, about all the opportunities. Academic institutions, you also have the diasporas, except that you call them alumni associations. But you know where your people are. You know exactly where your people are, you know what they do, you know how much they make. I wish my university was hardest in the power of uh, uh, alumni associations. Uh, but you should be able to act as a hub to just connect that knowledge and talent. Alexis and I should have been able to connect through the University of Puerto Rico. Alexis should have been able to say, hey, I am looking for this research and I need access to Congress. Is there anybody that can help me? And again, I am not a staffer. I do not work in Capitol Hill. But I would have been able to connect with all my friends that, that are. I would have been able to tell them, oh, you want to have a meeting with Lydia Velasquez? Sure. Let me just call my friend. She's the staffer that works the uh, Puerto Rican issues. Uh, if you need access to a uh, journalist, I can tell you with the guy with Novodilla that actually writes stuff and comes to us sometimes for questions and suggestions. These are things that I think we need to do a better uh, job of connecting. But the organic connections are great, and, they, and social media is fantastic, and like Alexis, once I joined Twitter, I never left the place, and I continue to make connections. But I think that we need to put a little bit of more uh, intentional organization, and that is my challenge to academic institutions. There needs to be an intentional connection where you think beyond the boundaries of the people that are your academic researchers, the people on your roster, and think there are resources outside of your boundaries that are, for, are available for free. They just want to help change the world. The second uh, opportunity 
uh, is to create that community uh, abroad so you can respond with agility. You can't wait for the disaster to happen to say, hey, what about we do this and what about we do that? You need to start creating that community beforehand. And don't only use them for disaster response, use them for disaster recovery. But Alexis was drawing in a way, it touched on both areas. Some of them were to tell people we need to respond a little bit better. The crisis is not over, the hurricane happened. But even in October, the crisis is still very much present. And even in November, the crisis was still very much there. Uh, now we're in disaster recovery. We can still support it. I have a lot of friends that are still willing to put their talents. And it's trying to find that connection with the power of universities that I think we will be able to get the biggest bang for the buck. The, uh, I, think, I think I'll just cut it in there and then we'll cover it in the Q&A. So, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much I, uh, uh, to my co-panelists uh, for the invitation to, the, uh, to this great activity. I'm just going to put my time right. I, I want to start by saying I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not here in, a, in an official capacity. I'm here on vacation. There's no single penny of tax dollars. So I'm a community member and a volunteer uh, along with uh, my colleague Eduardo and others in the Washington DC area. Very pleased to be here. Uh, so uh, when I worked out, I'm going to talk to you about a, a project that uh, started out uh, of a com completely grassroots uh, initiative in space that we created in DC. Uh, it's Polarados Para la Energia, Power for Energy, E2 if you like, E2 from home, easy to remember. And, and the whole point of this is, is to look at what we need to know about energy options that we do not know, but from the point of view of what people can learn. Um, when I was working in Puerto Rico, uh, I'm sure uh, that the explanations for the power authority for why their power went out were just so creative. They just impressed me. Uh, one of them related to lightning data. I, I've done a lightning study since then and, and will continue to, but they were really far out. Anyway, so here's a, here's a graphical uh, depiction of the situation. Uh, the, the grid failed, right? And anybody who was closely following it knew that was going to happen, maybe not to the degree it happened. Uh, and, and now we are talking about alternatives. Now, the world is going through renewables. There's nothing revolutionary in my saying that. Uh, that we know. The world's going there. That's not the only option. And on top of it, no solution is 100% uh, complete. There, there is no perfect solution. Everything has pros and cons. And everything has risk. Uh, there is uh, a, a flavor of, of what we're facing. We're facing uh, you know, the idea of solar and wind. But how? Right? How is a big question. Uh, there is a possibility of, uh, uh, I mean, for example, here, that gentleman there, his name is Rafael, he's from Caguas, um, and, uh, and he had a solar system. And, you know, you would think he would be all right, right? But when the hurricane hit, the grid went down, his system was connected to the grid because he had no storage. So the $125 a month ended up in nothing, right? Putting out a solar system. Uh, then there's the question of, well, you know, what about ocean thermal energy conversion on the, on the, on the uh, middle? Ocean wave energy conversion, what about those? Are those be feasible, viable? What are the pros and cons? Uh, what about natural gas, right, which is very plentiful in the U.S.? And if you would believe it, uh, uh, there's some people, some organizations, private organizations, that are doing cold fusion. You know, remember cold fusion, you wash your dishes, you take the same water that you used to wash your dishes, you put them in your reactor, and you have energy. If you believe what they're saying. That's still an active area of research, right? And, and they, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. They are, they are. That's the, that's the front page of chemical and engineering news. It's not the, uh, uh, you know, it's not like mine. It's, it's chemical and engineering news. That is the front page. Uh, I know Hans and Fleischmann are not around to, 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 to not tell us, but these were the chemists who, who were associated with that project. And then in about five to ten years, and I know I'm going to say a word that for some people is verboten, uh, 
if there are small nuclear reactors being developed. I'm, I'm not here advocating any solution, by the way. I have to tell you that all front. I'm not, I don't have a course in the race. But in five, ten years, that might be an option. And I know that some people don't want to talk about it. I, I'm open to, to talking about it. And, and this is about the time scale by, in which we're going to have some major decisions about our, about our power options. So there, are, there it is. Okay, <clears throat> so what is the purpose of E2, of, the, of this project, and Power for Energy? It's to enable multidisciplinary energy literacy, uh, where people can become knowledgeable about the pros and cons of these options, network, and, and this is really why I'm here, I want to network with you, right? That's one of the checklists that, that um, we heard from, um, I'm forgetting the name now, uh, on, on, on Monday, right? Uh, relationships. Network with similarly minded organizations and experts. We, we're going to need the experts, right? I'm not, I'm not an expert, although I've been following this. And, and, and then to help people become thought and process leaders. This is very important, the next bullet. Enable unbiased, I'm saying, unbiased analysis of potential energy options of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, focusing on what we do not know. In other words, the risk to consumer. You know, just to give an example, when you're talking about rooftop solar, that's all great and good. But now you take the risk. You assume completely the risk of that system. Everything goes bad, there's not going to be a truck coming to help you. This is, see what I'm, what I'm getting at? Uh, and, and, and then to develop tr trusted citizen sources. We have a problem with information in Puerto Rico. There's a cacophony of voices telling us, do this, do that. Well, who's right? Who's telling us the truth? I'm a compulsive fact checker, so this is natural. Uh, uh, for me. <laughs> decisions are being made, and decisions will have to be made by individuals, and decisions are going to be made for us. <clears throat> we have this uh, great law, <clears throat> and, and the implementation of that law is going to require additional decisions. How do we participate in that discussion? Well, we need to democratize that discussion by becoming literate. That is my answer. That's the first uh, step. So what is the method for this uh, E2 project? is to identify the pros and cons of the alternatives and, the, uh, and then draw from rigorous sources of information. That to me is peer-reviewed academic journals, national academy reports, reports from the professional societies like the IEEE, and expert reporting in the New York Times to just give a few examples. Third point, adopt a non-partisan evidence-based framework analysis. Non-partisan evidence-based framework analysis. I know the status is a very interesting question. That's super variable here. Uh, so this gives you an example of some of the areas that are, that, that are open to study, right? Because the status quo, which is to, you know, the slightly operated grid that we're going to get, natural gas, photovoltaic. I think I think by now we know the the uh, assortment. Project. What are the project outcomes? If this succeeds, the outcomes are user-centric uh, education. Maybe this can be also uh, adopted by schools and serve as a basis for uh, a curriculum. We have a crisis of STEM education in Puerto Rico, right? And I say that because in most schools, I'm a public school system dude. I went to public school system all my life. I had a biology teacher who me physics and who didn't know anything about physics. Flunked me in the first exam. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so the other thing we want to do is, last year we do all this learning, right, which is not distributed. You can do it in your Mofongo Club. I hope all of you are members of a Mofongo Club, I am. <laughs> you can do this study, right, or with your family or wherever. And I'm a resource, my, the role that I see for myself is as a chief editor, because I've done that professionally and help others do this. But you can steal the idea and take it. And I, I, I lose absolutely nothing and we gain. Uh, and at the end of it, we're going to have a presentation. This is why we need a lot of different expertise. A presentation of our findings, our study, that can be communicated with communities in general, in English and in Spanish. So we need a, this is highly collaborative, very scalable. If we can have 10 people working. I already have some people you know, who, who uh, want to work with me and the right, right expertise. Uh, and, and, and collaborative and scalable. It can involve as many people as, uh, as they want because there's nothing that keeps you from doing this learning and synthesizing. Uh, we need all different kinds of skills, right? That, that energy has 
health, technical, scientific, legal, uh, social, political options, all of the status of an option, uh, and, and so on, communication, right? Uh, and like I said, uh, individuals uh, can scale what they want to do. You want to work on a topic of this, you just want to work on, on say, wind energy uh, in the eastern part of Puerto Rico, go ahead, right? Now, you go scout the information. This could not be possible without the internet era, right? So, with addition to cat pictures, we can get actual technical information. And, uh, and you can go research that and document that and bring your knowledge with the requirements that you have to document. It has to be referentiable and it has to be verifiable. If I'm telling you, well, you know, the nuclear is going to be 20 cents a kilowatt hour, where is the reference for that? And how good a reference is that? That's what we want to do here. And then bring all that information together, put it in a unified common spreadsheet, that's how, where our prime material will be, and then share it with others, and then translate it. Because no knowledge is good if you cannot be communicated, right? So that's, uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much. Was a, well, was a chancellor, by the way, but he was at least a president of one of the main colleges in Queens. 